And we did come back from the young adult retreat this past week. What a blessed and wonderful time it was, truly. We have a picture, I believe, of the group uh, that we had. Um, just a great turnout, just a great time of sharing, just intimacy. Um, really the first retreat since the pandemic. And so uh, we missed it, right? We missed that uh, really time face-to-face -face over a extended period of time. I joined on Monday. We learned so much. That was one of the things that we heard from the people that did attend the retreat, that they learned a lot um, about this essence of returning to God, this theme of return, right? I learned a lot as well when I joined on Monday, especially the game and fellowship time that our brothers Aaron and Sam led there. I learned a couple of interesting facts, right, about our elders. Uh, did you know that uh, there's an elder who once jumped off a moving train? Can you guess who that was? Yes, our elder Shimon, our, our Spartan race, uh, extreme uh, <laughs> Oh, the risk taker there, kind of like me, but hey, you know, another level. Elder Shimon once jumped, um, jumped off a moving train. Insane. There's an elder who doesn't like to wear ties. Can you guess who that is? Jay, possibly, but it's actually the presider today, Elder Dave. Elder Dave is a surgeon. He hates ties. If it's his birthday, do not get him a tie. I, I once did that. I gave him a tie for his birthday. He's never worn it once. I don't believe it, right? So don't give him a tie. He'll just waste your money. Um, there's another elder, lastly whose nickname back in college was Pesky. Pesky. Can you guess who that was? It's the elder with his head down in the back. That guy right there in the corner, Elder Tay. Pesky, huh? You got to explain that one a little bit. Okay, <laughs> later on after service, I have no idea why they called you that, but we learned a lot, a lot of fun, but obviously more than learning about elders and having fun times and such. Of course, we learned the theme of return. What it means to return, right? what it means actually to return, how to return back to God, as Pastor Rich preached, how we can return back. But then most importantly on that Monday night, why, why, how to return to God, right? The how is the key in all of this. Of course, what is important, the um, how is important, but most importantly, the why, the why, we return is the most important thing, right? The why is the motivation, the reason why we do things. It's the reason why you and I live the way we do. It's the reason why we act and speak and talk and do things. It comes down to the why in life. You can return back to God and we can you know, come back to him and, and we know how to do it. But unless it's for the right why, then it's not really a return at all, right? And that's the thing that we have to assess after this retreat for you young adults that attended. Perhaps some of you committed to return back to God in faith. For some of you here, uh, worshiping with us um, in your spiritual journey, who's been in this cycle uh, as well, um, this uh, aspect of returning back to God, perhaps even uh, in your life. We've been learning this cycle that we've seen in the book of Judges, this pattern of you know, obedience, faithfulness, you know, serving God, the doing aspect, right? Obedience. But then just that, uh, cyclical pattern we see in the spiritual journey. We fall back, backsliding or falling back, whatever you call it, falling back into sin, idolatry. With idolatry then comes the oppression, just the hardships, the consequences of living in that sin. There, Believe me, that that life comes upon all who are in, immersed in the idolatry. This, it's a crushing way. And then this crying out, right? This crying out to God to save us, to deliver us. God does respond in delivering and forgiving but once we're forgiven, once we are delivered and saved, we, we, we say we return back to God. But what we've been seeing in this book of Judges so far, this pattern is increasingly becoming more and more negative, right? With each judge, with each deliverer, there's a continual downward spiral. It's not just the same cyclical pattern that a lot of us experience in our Christian walk. It's a downward spiral. This return back to God here in our passage today is put into question. This devotion to God, to serve him once again. What's behind it? What's motivating your, your heart to return back to God? That's what this passage is about today. We got to be wary of this thing I'd like to call today, this convenient devotion in our lives. A devotion that is merely convenience. There's three 
points that I want to make about this convenient devotion. The number one, a convenient devotion only wants God when we're in trouble. A convenient kind of devotion only seeks after God when we're in trouble. Secondly, this convenient devotion, it angers God. It angers him. Lastly, a convenient devotion, it cheapens God's grace. It cheapens the grace of God. We're going to look at these three. And as we have come to Judges chapter 10 now, it's the end of the Gideon, Abimelech cycle. The narrative introduces here now two non-cyclical minor judges and Judges 10, 1 to 5. After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel, Tola, the son of Pua. Then in verse 3, after him arose Jair, the Gilead, who judged Israel 22 years. He said he had 30 sons, rode on 30 donkeys, had 30 cities. Again, the cycle of moral depravity is what we're seeing here, especially with Jair here, consumed with wealth and power. This harem of 30 stars, 30 cities. This is self-interest. Materialism is continuing to be rampant. Yes, there are short periods of rest and peace, but now we continue this downward spiral of the judges. And here we're at the next major judge that we're going to cover in the next three weeks, actually. This judge named Jephthah. Jephthah. He's the eighth judge in the cycle. And what's interesting to note is there's a lot of narrative that is devoted to this judge Jephthah, okay? A lot of space. And, and I've said it before, if you read the Bible and you're going through it, and, and now you're learning this inductive Bible study of how to really understand and interpret scripture. When there's a lot of space devoted to a certain narrative or story or a certain person, there's a reason for that. It's because God deems it important. Okay. It's really important. We got to take a closer look then at why the writer and judges have devoted so much space to this judge Jephthah in the, in the epilogue, I guess, so that leads up to Jephthah here today. This convenient devotion Devotion that's only for convenience. We see this here in verse 6 of chapter 10, starting once again this cyclical pattern. And we should be familiar with this by now. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And they served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Once again, the people did what was evil. They forsaken God, did not serve him. By the time here that we're seeing in Judges, the list of Israel's apostasy, this foreign idol worship, it is considerably expanded. Can't you see? Think about it. It's not just now they're, 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 they're falling into just one idolatry to one God. There's seven groups of foreign deities listed here. Think about it. Seven foreign gods of worship, idol worship. If we think of some religions like, oh, you know, there's religions like Hinduism that has hundreds and maybe thousands of gods, you know, gods of all different kinds of origins and forms. Some of them half animal, half man, half God. We see, that's crazy to think about. Who would believe in such a religion? Israelites, the believers of Yahweh, the followers of Yahweh themselves have turned now to follow and serve seven other gods. Unless we think that, hey, Christians, you know, we only worship the one and only true God. I've talked about idolatry enough by now. Idolatry is anything that we worship other than God himself, anything that we put above God, anything that we worship that is created Rather than the creator, we can list, I'm sure, a lot more than seven of those deities that we can possibly, obviously, worship in our lives. This devotion, once to Yahweh, now has turned to these seven other foreign deities. And this devotion that we're seeing here, God has delivered them, rescued them, Israelites serving God, but yet, what is the service? What is this obedience? What is this devotion? Is it genuine? This convenient devotion that we're seeing. A convenient devotion is one that continues to live according to your own desires. We say we're devoted to God and Yahweh, 
but yet our actions and our lives prove otherwise. It's a devotion that we speak of, but yet our actions, the proof of it shows that we actually live according continually to our own desires, our own flesh. We turn to these other gods in our lives. And this convenient devotion, it just doesn't just go get swept by the, under the rug and just kind of just, you just kind of just pass on through in your life. This devotion that's convenient, it angers God. It angers him. Look with me in God's response, verse 7. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. This word kindle literally means it burns. Can you envision that, this visual picture? You know, whenever we see these incredible, beautiful depictions, these adjectives that are used, or vision, just picture it in your mind. God's anger kindling, burning. His anger is seething. It's in flames. His anger is, is, is bursting out in, in this passion. Have we considered the last time our disobedience or idolatry, how it angers God? Have we considered such? When's the last time we disobey or fall back into whatever else that we worship. And we consider this truth that that infuriates God, angers him, it pains him. God in response, it says in verse seven, he sold them into the hands of the Philistines, into the hands of the Ammonites. There's consequences. There are consequences, repercussions to disobedience, to sin. There is tremendous hardship that comes into our lives when we disobey God. And we see this in verse 8 to 9. With the Ammonites, the Philistines, it says they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For 18 years, they oppressed all the people of Israel to the point at the bottom of verse nine, so that Israel was severely distressed. Again, this word in verse eight, what does God actually end up doing? He, he, he sells them into the hands of the Philistines, the Ammonites, and it says he, he crushed them. It's these two words, crushed and oppressed. This crushingly oppressed them. Can really, really crush them. Some of our lives, you know, we feel crushed. <laughs> we feel exceedingly just oppressed. And quite often, it's a result and consequence of our sin. But God allows these foreign gods, idols, false deities to crush even his people. It's not out of vindictive action or hatred or judgment. We'll see why he does this. But there's consequence of sin, and it is crushing. I'm sure we've experienced uh, the ramifications of that at some points in our lives. What do the people do? What do we do in those cases where we're feeling so, so distressed? We cry out. Call out again for God. That's what we see in verse 10. The people of Israel cried out to the Lord. We have sinned against you. Because we have forsaken our God. We have served the Baals. It seems gen genuine, doesn't it? This cry. Seems like a call of repentance, a cry. God, we have sinned against you. God, I've wronged you. I've forsaken you. Forgive me. I've once again fallen to the same idols, the Baals or the Astaroths. Forgive me. It seems genuine. Our cries often seem such. Maybe it's because we assume that this God that we cry out to should more or less just instantaneously restore us whenever we cry out, right? Just pray, the Bible says. Pray, cry out. 
Even as we continually fall into idolatry over and over again, we just assume God will save us. God will forgive us. He will deliver us. But that is not the case that we see in this passage. What happens next? Yahweh actually doesn't respond with deliverance and forgiveness and peace. In fact, he responds with seven groups of oppressors. For the seven foreign deities that the Israelites have worshipped, God, Yahweh responds with seven groups of oppressors. In verse 11 to 14, look with me. The Lord said to the people of Israel, Did I not save you from the Egyptians, from the Amorites, from the Ammonites, and from the Philistines? The Sidonians also, and the Malachites, and the Malachites oppressed you. You cried out to me. I saved you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. Is this God we know? Is this the God that you worship? The Lord rebukes. He rebukes Israel here. In fact, he reminds him, I not only am angered, I am responding to your disobedience by bringing up upon you seven oppressors who will continually exceedingly crush you and oppress you. For the seven deities you worship, seven oppressors to bring distress to your life. There's even some divine humor and sarcasm here in verse 14 as God says, go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. This convenient devotion angers God. Why? It's become all too familiar. This pattern has become all too familiar in his eyes. He's not upset. He's not angered because Israel hasn't put away these foreign deities in the past, these foreign gods. He's angry. Time and time again. God has saved them, intervened. And time and time again, Israel has reverted right back to serving these gods, forsaking the only true God. Yahweh understands. The cycle too well. Is their devotion genuine? Is it real? Is it in true repentance or is it just an act, a feeble attempt just to get what they want at this immediate time, knowing that there's not much authenticity behind what they're saying. Is this devotion only for convenience sake? Going to God only for convenience, out of convenience, only when they need his help. Yes, God may end their trouble. But they'll know they'll go right back to their old ways once God helps him as he's done in the past. Oh, Lord. Do to us whatever seems good. Deliver us. We have to be wary of this convenient devotion. It angers God. I'm sure parents have understood this, perhaps. I've understood what it's like to have children who you continually love and, 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 and pour out your life for, and you continue to try to teach and teach and teach. There's expectations I have, especially of Caleb, my oldest son. I keep calling him out because he reminds me so much of myself. He's my mini me, right? And all the faults that I have, I see it in him so much. But I tell him, teach him. You cannot do this and do that. Yes, dad. Sure, dad. And time and time again, the same patterns over and over. Frustrating beyond belief. Infuriating to me. Sometimes, you know, he's 10 years old now. He's too, he's too old for, you know, mem- you know the, the, the spanking. He's too old for that. Okay, look. Sometimes, you're reading. Can you imagine how God feels? God, I won't do it again. Just one more time, forgive me, save me. Would you deliver me? Sure, son. Thank you. 
and go right back. John's angered by this inconvenient devotion, this convenient devotion. He's not okay with this. Why does this anger God so much? Because an convenient devotion that, again, just goes to God whenever we need or, 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 or continues to live uh, according to our, our desires and our flesh and the way we want, a convenient devotion, it cheapens God's grace. It's cheapened what he has done for us. A devotion that is convenient, we take for granted his work, his love, his compassion, his mercy. A convenient devotion. It has theology all wrong. This mindset that we think that God will forgive me no matter what. That God's grace is infinite, is it not? D.A. Carson, again, Professor Trinity, wrote this book called God's Love and God's Wrath. God's Love and God's Wrath. And in this book, there's an excerpt. He says, we mistake grace for license. We mistake God's grace for license, uh, this freedom. He tells of a story when he used to meet with this young man from the French West Africa for the purpose of practicing their German. <laughs> he wrote, once a week or so, we had enough of the study, so we went out for a meal together and retreated to French, the language we both knew very well. In the course of those meals, we got to know each other. And so I learned that his wife was in London. She was training to be a medical doctor. He was an engineer who needed fluency in German to pursue doctoral studies in engineering in Germany. So he's there. But D.A. Carson soon discovered once or twice a week that his friend, this young man, disappeared into the red light district of the town. Of course, he went to pay his money and have his woman. Eventually, I got to know him very well and enough to ask him what would you do if you discovered that your wife was doing something similar in London? What would you do to her? Oh, he said, I'd kill her. It's a bit of a double standard, isn't it? Carson says. You don't understand. You see, where I come from in Africa, the husband has the right to sleep with many women. But if a wife is unfaithful to her husband, she must be killed. Carson said, but you told me you were raised in a mission school, did you not? You know that the God of the Bible does not have a double standard like that, surely. And this young man, with a bright smile, he replied, Ah, le bon Dieu, il donne un pardon, c'est son métier. In French, it literally means, Ah, oh, God is good. He's bound to forgive us. That's his job. Do we believe that? God is good. God is loving. He's bound to forgive us. Will he not? For those of us, perhaps, that maybe believe that, I want to see, you know, it makes sense, doesn't it? In essence, we, we, we have in our mindset that, that because of God's grace, his mercy, we're forgiven. And therefore, it doesn't really matter what we do, right? Because God will forgive us nonetheless. So we can live however we want. It doesn't matter how I live now because I'm forgiven. So I can continue to go on living evil and sin. This license, we call it. The theological, theological term is called licentiousness. It doesn't matter. I can go on sinning because the law doesn't apply to me anymore because God's already forgiven me and he always will. Do you believe that? So the Israelites are showing in this passage is their mindset. Their understanding of God's grace. Verse 15 again, we have sinned. I'm sorry, God, but do to us whatever seems good to you, but only please deliver us this day. 
save us once again. Yeah, I messed up. Yeah, I, 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 I sinned again. But you'll forgive me. You'll deliver me. So it'll be okay. Is this devotion? A convenient devotion is one that wants God only when we're in trouble, right? Yet continues to live according to our own desires. Israelites are not living under this true understanding of God's grace here. It's not a world that, that is under God's grace. They've created a world where there's either two other things. It's either legalism or it's licentiousness. Okay? And that's the world that a lot of people actually live in today. Even those who are very religious most of the people are in those two camps. We, either they're, they're, they're thinking about legalism, the do's and don'ts of religion, the rules, or licentiousness, this liberty, freedom, this license to sin. There's an article written by Molly Hemingway in The Federalist. It's titled, Is a Lego Movie the Most per Subversive Pro-Liberty Film Ever? That was the title of the article. You ever watch that, The Lego Movie? A lot of kids, so of course I watched it, right? Is the Lego movie the most subversive pro-liberty film ever? You know, if you've seen this uh, movie, there, there's a couple of characters. There's this one cold-hearted president business, remember him? He controls the media, the business, the government through his, you know, Octon Energy Corporation. He represents legalism. Under his iron fist rule, everyone follows instructions at home and at work. It's enforced by this cheery, I got my eyes on you. All the ads and surveillance cameras. Better not. I got my eyes on you. Yeah, I'm impressed. A lot of people see religion that way or Christianity that way. God, uh, he's got my, his eyes on me. So I got to behave and live a certain way. Act a holy Christian to other people. Got to follow what's in the Bible, the do's and don'ts. A lot of people get turned off by that. They don't want to submit to a religion. It's just all about rules and do's and don'ts. I get it. So then there's another group in this Lego movie, the Master Builders. Remember them? The rebellious. They refuse to slavishly follow senseless rules. Gets them locked up ultimately by the president of business. Right? But the film, it shows this other extreme form. Not legalism, but lawlessness, right? Remember the movie's hero? Former rule follower, this construction worker legalist named Emmett. Remember him? He lands in this cloud cuckoo land, a place without any rules or laws to follow. There's a scene where Emmett approaches cloud cuckoo land. He watches a horde of Legos dancing, whirling, and partying to loud music. He's like, okay. He says, right? I'm just going to come out right now and say, I have no idea what's going on or what this place is all about, right? And suddenly this, like, this figure appears, this cute little unicorn, right? This unicorn kitty hybrid bounces up to Evan and yells, Hi, hey, Princess Unikitty. I welcome you all to Cloud of Cuckoo Land. Evan watches this unrestricted party and says, So uh, there are no signs on anything. How does anyone know what not to do? Unikitty cheerfully explains, Well, right here in Cuckoo Land, there are no rules. There's no government, no babysitters, no bedtimes, no frowny faces, no bushy mustaches, and no negativity of any kind. And then one of Emmett's friends sarcastically replies, you just said the word no like a thousand times, right? Nina Kitty smiles sweetingly and says, and there's also no consistency. Emmett asks, so do you guys have laws here or building codes or gravity? And Nina Kitty says, any idea is a good one, except the not happy ones. Those you push down deep, deep inside where you'll never, ever, ever, ever find. Live however you want. Doesn't matter. Lawlessness, or in the Christian understanding, licentiousness, live however you want. Now, why? Because God is gracious. So these laws don't apply to you anymore. These commands, whatever, doesn't really mean much. Yeah, you should try to be a good person and stuff, but in the end, God forgives you. So what's the big deal? What does it matter if I'm good or bad? I'm forgiven, so it's all good. Many people in the world live in these two paradigms. Legalism or even licentiousism. Live as you please. 
This is not grace. This is not a world or understanding that is under God's grace. Again, D.A. Carson says, we mistake grace for license. A lot, quite often. The theological question that, that's raised, and rightfully so, should we be able to continue to sin because of grace? In other words, does the fact that we're not under the law because of what Christ has done, but under grace now, does it give us this license to sin? It's a very important question. I hope you ponder this. If not, let's ponder it a bit today. Does it give you a freedom to live however you want? Does it really matter in the end, since God is merciful and forgiving? Paul addresses this in the whole letter to the church in Rome, right? Read Romans if you really want to get down to the deep of this. But Romans chapter 6 is a great chapter. He, he tackles this right on. And in verse 1 to 2, Paul writes, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Says. The answer to the question, should we be able to continue to sin because of grace? Paul emphatically says, no. By no means. Grace does not give you a license to sin. This license to think that you can do whatever you want and live however you want because Jesus died for you on the cross. If you think grace gives you this freedom now to live however you want and continually sin because God's gracious, or you believe that you deserve his grace by anything or what matter, we do not truly understand then what God's grace is, what his mercy is. Paul continues to write in verse 15, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Again, by no means. R.C. Sproul, the great theologian, reformer, he, he, he shares in this passage in particular, Paul he has to explain that anyone who uses the grace of God as an excuse to sin and, and, and break the law, you have not really truly grasped the gospel, the good news. Yes, God has justified us apart from our obedience to the law. Praise God. In fact, our creator has declared us righteous in spite of our obedience to the law, for we have not perfectly kept his commandments, of course. But as we have seen, God did not set his law aside when he justified us. In fact, he sent Christ to keep it in our behalf. Christ didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it, Scripture says, to render the perfect obedience of which you and I are incapable of doing. So that the law of God is so important to him that he does not justify us without having Christ keep it in our place, right? It demonstrates that the law's standards are not negotiable. We don't gain entry to heaven by obeying the law, but those who are citizens of God's kingdom, we then seek to live according to the law of that realm, says if we do not endeavor to follow God's law, then we show actually no evidence of this saving faith, this saving faith. And without the saving faith, the Bible clearly says we do not have eternal, eternal life, right? Everlasting life, salvation. Grace not only liberates us from the law, but it also does something else. It gives us a power a power to now live in accordance, in obedience to the law, to God's commands, to what he's called us to do. Not only frees us from the law, gives us this power unto obedience. A convenient devotion cheapens God's grace. But here's the thing, church. The grace that saves us, a genuine grace that saves you and I, it also changes us. A saving grace also changes us. Saves us and changes us. There's a difference, right? 
in the lives of people who have been saved by the grace of God, there is transformation, right? We say all the time, discipleship, the goal of, of, of discipleship is not just to make a disciple, you know, just to make someone who is mature and equipped, who knows the Bible and he's, you know, well-versed in scripture and all that. And that's good. And so that's not the end goal. The goal is, is, is not just to convert someone to Christianity, it's to transform them, change the, who they are, every part of their being. God's grace through his son Jesus, it does that, right? It has to help us reflect then what is a Christian? Is a Christian someone who's just forgiven by God? By what Jesus did? Is that it? Well, yes, Christians are forgiven by God, of course. Jesus' death on the cross, it takes upon God's justice, his wrath for us, yes, but is that all? You know, we say, you know, we're not perfect. Christians aren't perfect. So are we just forgiven then? Of course, there's no Christian that's perfect, you know, on this side of heaven. Of course not. But can a follower of Jesus just simply continue living on his or her life as one that is the same as before? as one that's unchanged. The Bible doesn't say that at all. In fact, one more passage I'll share with you in New Testament, Titus chapter two, verse 11 to 12. It says clearly what the grace of God does. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. That's a saving grace, right? But then look what the saving grace does. It trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, you see. This grace that saves us also is a grace that changes us. When we trust Christ as our Lord and Savior, that he's the only one that can restore this relationship back with God, make things right with him, that's what we're saying, declaring, you know, it's, it's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that's, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. This grace by grace, through faith. It's a saving grace, but yet it's a sanctifying grace. It changes us. It teaches believers to live in ways that are different from the patterns of the previous cycles, you know, of life. That was before we knew Christ, right? In the unbelief. When we think that, you know, salvation uh, by grace is now this, you know, freedom to sin, this license to sin, we, we don't understand this grace at all, right? This grace that justifies everyone who trusts Jesus as Lord. Also, it says in Titus, it trains every believer in holiness. Sanctification literally means to be made holy. Verse 12, Christians renounce. It turns away ungodliness. The other, I idols and deities that we always were enslaved by. Those who have been reconciled to the Holy God, we're not going to be satisfied continuing to live in that immorality. We're not content there. But yet, the saving grace, the sanctifying grace now, it, 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 it gives us power to live, as Titus says, the self-controlled, upright, godly lives today. Not just when we go to heaven, but today, here and now, grace trains us to control. And the self-control is very important. Control from what? From the flesh, from the desires of the flesh. It teaches believers to be upright in our relationships with one another. To rightly relate to him by seeking his honor and glory. That's what it means to be godly. Those who have been redeemed by Christ, their lives are changed because the purpose of his redeeming work on the cross was simply that, to redeem us from all lawlessness, right? To make for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. The grace of God that paid for our sins, it teaches us to turn away from sin as we follow Christ through faith. No wonder Paul so emphatically answers, no. Should not continue to be in sin. Since salvation is all grace, it is not permissible to go on sinning. By no means, he says. Yes, grace 
is free. We did not do anything to earn it, to work for it, or even to deserve it. But it is not cheap. There's a difference. Grace is free. It is not cheap. It has come at a great cost. And we know that. It cost God his only son, his life. It comes at a great cost. Have we cheapened God's grace in any way? God's grace changes us. And if we look at our lives, the things we do, how we live, the things we say, how we interact with others, on the outside, it may look holy. It may look like a devotion. But all that on the outside, again, remember, it, that's not really what's important. God knows our hearts on the inside. And that's what he's after. That's how our passage ends in verse 16. The Israelites do what we think people ought to do. In obedience, they put away the foreign gods from among them and serve the Lord. Isn't that good? Isn't that a good thing, Pastor, to end this passage? They, they, they put away the foreign gods and served him? But what is God after? The why. The why. Why? What's their motivation? What's inside their hearts? God knows our hearts. God knows their hearts. Have they really changed? For well, God's response or lack thereof, he gives us the answer. It says, he became impatient over the misery of Israel. God became impatient. In the NIV, it says, he could bear Israel's misery no longer, okay? This verse in Hebrew literally translated as the Lord's soul was shortened. Think about what that means. What's that saying? The Lord's soul was shortened. He's frustrated. God is exasperated. He's angry in the face of intolerable disobedience. The Lord's soul was shortened. Although Israelites had put away their gods and served the Lord, guess what? Their oppression will continue to build. We're going to see that next week. Their attempts, the, this convenient devotion, is going to lead to further turmoil and things will get worse. Believe me, next week you'll hear the story of Jephthah. It is going to be bad. It'll be worse. As I invite our worship team up, though, as we conclude, the saving grace, as we reflect upon what that is, it's a changing grace. Who will be called to deliver Israel? We'll find out next week. But before then, we got to look and think about our God once again, who has revealed himself over and over again. God has poured his heart into the Israelites time and time again. God has poured his heart into you time and time again. But in spite of his gracious compassion and his goodness, delivering them from time and time again from their enemies, the oppressors. The Israelites have continually turned away and worship other gods. In their fickleness, they have made a mockery of God's grace. They have taken advantage of his attributes, his character, his holiness, and his mercy. And that is why, church, God is angry. He's angry at a convenient devotion. I think we can hide our sinfulness from other people. Surely, perhaps, we cannot hide it from God. He examines the hearts. Jeremiah 17 says, 
I, the Lord, search the hearts and I test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. He knows our fruits, so the heart that he's after. How is your devotion, church? Let's examine that today. How is your devotion to God, his son, Jesus Christ? For a convenient devotion only goes to him when we need. A convenient devotion only wants God when we're in trouble. A convenient devotion just continues to live according to our own desires. This convenient devotion angers God because it cheapens his grace. Some of you are led to a time of repentance. Let's go. Let's pray. Ask God to search our hearts. This is an area, God, where I have cheapened the grace of God. I have taken for granted what you have done for me. And I've almost lived as if whatever I do doesn't matter any longer. Forgive me, Father, for cheapening your grace. Lead us back to the right theology that a saving grace is a changing grace. Would it change us more and more, Father? Mold us, shape us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived in perfect obedience to which we could not. May we emulate Christ in our life today, here and now. May we, Father, be faithful. May we, Father, renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and lead us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. For your glory's sake, we pray. Let's go to God in prayer, church.